who are starting out on mainframe, I thought this picture would be helpful as you think about writing a program and how it's treated by the operating system. Essentially, you have a COBOL program that is carved out a region and your program runs in that region. You're not the only thing in the region. If, if your program was a subroutine, it might have been called by another program or it might, could have been called by the operating system, kind of like a subroutine. Uh, there are I.O. buffers in the region. Uh, your program wants to read data, so the data exists on a disk somewhere. There's large I.O. buffers. It can be hundreds of these things. Uh, so there's data that exists in these buffers we need to address. There's data that's being passed to you by a calling program. And in today's COBOL, you can allocate space dynamically. Let me back up. Sorry about that. You can allocate space dynamically and ask for dynamic storage on the fly. So there's more storage that you might need to address. And that's what you do in the data division. Uh, there's three divisions or three sections in a division. There's a working storage section and you use that to describe all the data that you're in variables that belong inside your program. Along with that, you get a file section and that finds all the files that are on the disk and all the record structures that you get in these I.O. buffers that bring your data in. And then finally, there's a linkage section where you can define all the variables, <coughs> excuse me, for uh, data that's passed to you or that's dynamically allocated. So there's three different sections that we're gonna talk about. And this is a good picture to have in your head for how it all relates to each other. So we'll start these three sections. The file section is for defining files and the record structures that are in these files. These mainframes are really sophisticated and they're designed to pump data at you. And uh, the methods they use are quite sophisticated. There's lots of access methods, lots of different types of files. If you haven't programmed on a mainframe much, then you should be aware that mainframe I.O. is record. Am I having, having trouble here? Hang on. There we go. Mainframe I.O. is record oriented. <clears throat> it's not field oriented, sort of like Java. In Java, you're asking, give me the next field. Give me the next field. But typically in, in mainframe programming, you're asking for records at a time. So I have some tips along the way. <clears throat> As you're learning to do I.O. in COBOL, you want to read a file and write a record. That's kind of an old mantra. Anytime you want to access uh, a file for input, you're going to name the file name. But if you're trying to produce output, you have to name the file record. So the mantra is read a file, write a record. Let's have a second tip, and that's you might want to avoid read into's and write from. So there's a couple of ways you can do um, input. On, on the mainframe, locate mode and move mode. And there's sort of a performance hit and it's pretty substantial when you start doing read into's and write froms. That's all I'll say about that. Let's move on. Here's an example of what you would see in a file section. This is simplified. There's lots more that we obviously won't talk about, but basically you give it a file name and you give it a picture of your record. I have two files, an FD for customer file and an FD for a sales report, and I have two records. So there's my, there's my file section. And my tip is don't reference these fields. Don't touch or try to modify or read these fields before you open the file or after you close the file. Those, those, these are the areas that are referencing those buffers, and they, it only makes sense to touch these fields if the file is still open. Move on to the linkage section. That's the second section we'll look at. It's used to describe fields that are outside of your program. In other words, the data that's being passed to you by other programs or data that might exist in dynamically acquired storage. You may not own the storage for this. <laughs> the mouse is killing me. Sorry, I keep flipping screens. But well, I'll get better, hopefully. Uh, you may not own the storage for this thing. There used to be very strict um, rules about the linkage section and what you could use to uh, use it for. But those rules have been 
loosened uh, as the versions have gone by. So if, you, if you're coming back to COBOL, having programmed it years ago, you may find that you can do more with the linkage section than you could before. We can now use it to manipulate areas that are dynamically acquired by using pointers. So that may be a feature you haven't used before if you programmed quite a while back. We can exploit this feature to build modern data structures. So if you're interested in data structures like stacks and queues, um, this is how you would do it in COBOL. Here's a linkage section example. Uh, perhaps a program's wanting to pass uh, a couple of parameters to me. I lump them together in one big parameter called name age. In the procedure division, they would, uh, the, the program would look like this. It would say procedure division using name age. I would name this linkage section area in my program, realizing that this is the data that's going to be passed to me from a separate program. All right, we're going to move pretty quickly through these. We're not stopping for too many details, but I'm trying to give you, just orient you to how this stuff fits together. The working storage is where you define all the fields in your program. There's about four different elementary types, numeric, alphanumeric, alphabetic, which is quite old, and a newer type called national. Alphabetic has pretty much been subsumed by alphanumeric. Alphabetic was just for data that was letters of the alphabet and a blank. So pretty much we can do all of that with alphanumeric. So if you're just starting out in COBOL, this is pretty much what the data looks like. It looks like numeric data or alphanumeric data. Data in COBOL is hierarchical, just like XML. If you're familiar with XML, the data structures are hierarchical. That matches perfectly with COBOL, and that's why COBOL is a great language for processing XML. There's lots of, uh, there's several statements that you can use to process XML easily in COBOL. When we're describing COBOL, we'll use level numbers, in particular 0, 1 through 49, um, as, as indicating how this, what this hierarchy looks like and which fields are subordinate. So um, we'll, we'll talk about this in, in more detail. As we go through this, if there are questions, stop. Uh, feel free to stop me. We'll stop, uh, just as we would in a regular class. Otherwise, I'm going to keep plowing through this. But uh, if there are questions, feel free to ask. So we've got these level numbers. Let's, let's move forward. The level numbers are, are at the front of the field definitions. Um, so we can, this is an example of a work, typical working storage section. We have an 01 called customer count. It's a packed decimal field with three digits and a sign. This is um, an independent item because it's not subdivided. There's no fields underneath it. And it's called an independent item in COBOL. This particular field is a group item because it is subdivided into subfields. And there's a hierarchy here that's indicated by these level numbers. As you get higher numbers, you're going deeper into the hierarchy. Like in all programming languages, a variable is a storage area with a name and a type. And we get the same idea going on in COBOL. So variables are, are data fields or data names or, or, or data items are essentially variables. Storage areas with names and types. The type determines the type of information that can go in the field and the type of operation that you can apply to the field. As we said before, there are elementary items. Oops, let me back up, sorry. There are elementary items that would be a single field. There are group items that would be a field that contains others. So part number here is a group, whereas part name and part number are elementary items. Get back to the we, level numbers. They run from 0, 01 to 49. Only 01 has a specific meaning. If you label something 01, it has to be at the top level of the hierarchy. And that makes it either a group item that has something underneath it, or it's an independent item off by itself. 
the specific numbers you choose doesn't really matter. What matters is the relation of the numbers to each other. As you go higher, we're going deeper into the hierarchy. Some companies have standards about, about the types of level numbers you choose. And so three and five are common increments. Dr. Weber, yes. One, one question here about uh, the sections in the data division. Um, what about local storage section in data division is the question. There is a local storage. <clears throat> so as I said, I'm trying to aim this at uh, beginners. And uh, so I've, I've omitted local storage from this discussion. But uh, I, I can refer you to the language manuals for that. Is that okay? Yes, sounds good. Thank you. Okay, so there's a lot. I'm, I'm, uh, there's a lot that's going to be left out. I'm trying to highlight just the things that perhaps you would see in a typical business program, uh, especially those and, and programs that that user that beginners might run. All right, so we've got group items, elementary items. <clears throat> this O1, which can either be a group or an independent item. And so here's an example. We've got customer table. It's at the top of the hierarchy. And it contains a 110 level item, which is called custom rec. That occurs a bunch of times. So this is actually a table. So this, this customer record is occurring uh, 100 times. Ah, this is driving me nuts. Sorry, my mouse is, is active. Um, Underneath that, every customer record consists of a customer name and a customer balance. Within customer name, you get the last and first names. These two are independent items, though. They're not subdivided. That brings us to the special level numbers. <clears throat> there are three, 66, 77, and 88, that have special significance. Personally, I never use 66. I've always thought it was a bad idea, but that is just my humble opinion. All right, so I would advise, especially if you're starting out in COBOL, not to use 66. It's for restructuring a field that already exists. And, and I would advise not using it. 77s were the original way that you could create an independent item. <clears throat> that restriction has loosened in COBOL, and now you can use 01s or 77s. Personally, I just have just switched over to using 01s always for independent items. But other programmers would have different opinions about that. 88, though, is an important uh, condition, and we'll talk about it in more detail in just a little bit. So those are the three special level numbers. When you're declaring something, there's five parts so that you can write down. You can put a level number. You can add the variable name. Won't go into all the details of naming variables something you could look up, but any reasonable names should, will probably work. There's a picture clause that indicates the size of the field and the whether it's numeric or alphanumeric and whether it has a sign or not. There's a usage clause. The usage clause determines the internal data type. Is it a packed decimal field? Is it binary? Is it alphanumeric? And finally, you can give it a value. Those are the five parts of every declaration. You can omit things. You don't have to code all five parts, but every field has to have a level number, right? Can't get away without a level number. So that's um, a requirement. And my only tip is, if you're a beginner, use indention to highlight this hierarchy. You want the program structure, physical structure, to reflect the, the logical structure as well. You can omit the name of a field as I've done here. If, you, if your program is never going to touch the field directly, you can leave the name off, or you can give it a name filler. That's the traditional way of creating an unnamed field in COBOL. In both cases, this is an unnamed field. I kind of prefer the first because it sort of makes the program look a little lighter if you're looking at it as a whole. But that's a matter of style. Every elementary field must have a picture. You can't, you cannot uh, omit the picture clause. That tells uh, 
the compiler how big this field is and whether it's numeric or alphanumeric. You can omit the usage clause. That's a little unusual, and I don't know of any other language that allows that. Uh, the usage clause would either be this one, packed decimal, or you can spell it out and say usage is packed decimal. That's where you're telling it the, the data type that you want. It's a packed decimal field. It's a binary field. In COBOL, you can leave it off. There's a default. And the default for this type of field, numeric fields, is, is called zone decimal. We'll talk about that some more. So it is possible to leave off uh, the usage clause. I don't recommend that, though. I would prefer to go ahead and let's, let's make a decision and not take a default. You can also leave off the words usage is. That's uh, just noise to the COBOL compiler. We're still talking about what can you omit when you define these fields. Well, group clauses never have explicit pictures. In other words, you never put a picture on a group. That's because it has an implicit picture. And the implicit picture is always picture X, and it's equal to the size of all the subordinate fields. So this is a 20-byte field, an 8-byte field. This one's in packed decimal. You'd have to know a little something about packed decimal here to be able to figure out how big this field is. I'll tell you quickly, it's five digits in front, two digits behind the, the implied decimal point. That's seven digits plus a sign. And in packed decimal, you pack two items per byte. So this is eight uh, things we need to put in a field, right? Seven digits plus a sign. And divided by two would be a four byte field. So this whole thing is going to be 32 bytes. One of the things you need to do if you're starting out in COBOL is learn some of the mainframe data types like pack decimal or zone decimal or binary. And we'll talk a little more about that. So that's my tip. Uh, get your nose in a book and learn a little bit about the mainframe data types. It's important that, that we be able to know the exact lengths of some of these fields. Sometimes it's not obvious. To a beginner, that might look like, what, five, six, seven, eight bytes, but it's actually a four byte field. The other um, tip I would give you is that any definitions that you code in the file definition have to be exact, right? You've got to be able to describe your data exactly. If it's off, your whole program will, will be an error. There's a little more leeway in working storage. Right? We can, oops, there's a little more leeway in working storage. Uh, the compiler is generous if you make certain wrong decisions. And that's, that's all I'll say at this point about that. What else can we omit? We can omit the value clause. If you omit the value clause in a declaration, then the field is uninitialized. Um, it is possible if a program is called multiple times, that the variables you've initialized can be reinitialized every time you call a program or not. You have a choice there. And for people that have coded uh, a bit longer, I'll just mention that you can read about the initial phrase uh, in the identification for that feature. All right. Here's uh, this slide gets at what happens when you define things sequentially. I apologize for all the movement of data. I'm not sure why my mouse is doing that. Let me get, sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Hang on. There we go. I'll try to be a little more careful. When we're defining things sequentially, they typically end up sequentially organized in storage. So if you define part name and part number sequentially in this definition, they will be physically sequential in memory as well. There's one exception to that, and that's for binary fields that are synchronized or properly aligned. Occasionally, the compiler will generate a few slack bytes between fields in order to get a binary field properly initialized. All right, we're finally getting back to these condition names. 
this is a feature that I think is, uh, not sure you can find this feature in another language in quite the same uh, fashion. Uh, but you can use this idea to make your programs a little more readable. The idea is if you had a field like TranCode, just a simple single byte field, picture X, you can give a condition name, good code, to the condition of TranCode having the value of G. So this 88 level says this is a condition and the condition is equivalent to TranCode having the value G. Bad code is equivalent to TranCode being B. And then different is, is the condition TranCode being I. We can use these condition names in various ways. I can, and for instance, I can say set good code to true. And that has the effect of moving a G into the TranCode. But in a sense, this is sort of better documentation. It's, it's getting closer to what I'm actually trying to accomplish rather than just um, moving a, a, a value to a flag somewhere. I can also test these condition codes. So I can say if good code, and that would be equivalent to uh, writing an if statement, if trend code equals G. And the beginner tip I have here is you can't set a condition code to false. Why would that be? Well, if trend code is false, we know it's not G, but we wouldn't be quite sure whether it was B or I if we allowed um, condition codes to be set to false. So you can only set a condition code to true, and you can test it with an if statement. If you use these things well, you can do things that are a little more complex. For instance, you can have conditions that are a little more complicated. Values are zero through 12 for child, or values are 13 through 19 for teen, and values 20 through 120 for adult. And then you can test them. You can say if teen, if adult, if child. The nice thing about writing like this is it, it's sort of self-documenting, and it's easy to modify. For instance, if, if you decide if conditions change and you decide that 18 is now, or 19 is now an adult, you can just simply change your condition and the actual logic of your program doesn't have to be altered at all. So that's a good thing. On the other hand, it can be a bad thing. I have seen programs where uh, if you choose the wrong condition names, it makes the program harder to read. So like all features in all languages, things can be well used or not. The picture clauses end up being built with these characters, nines for digits, X's for alphanumeric, V for an implied decimal point. It's interesting that the arithmetic, internal arithmetic on this machine does not contain decimal points. If you're doing decimal arithmetic, the actual decimals don't exist in memory. So that's why we're using a V for implied. I'll talk a little more about that because that's kind of a beginner's uh, mistake in some cases. S is used for signs. You can use an A for the letters of the alphabet, but typically I think this has sort of fallen out of use. These are some uh, just some quick examples of pictures that you could code. The parentheses are repetition factors. These two are equivalent. Um, that's about all I'll say about it. This one pokes out at me, jumps out at me because of it's lacking a sign. And that is sometimes a beginner's error that we'll talk about as well. If you start using symbols like these, a B for a blank, a slash, asterisk, period, minus signs, credit or debit, dollar signs, once you start mixing these symbols in, you're getting into the realm of edited fields. So if any of your pictures have these symbols, you should be editing. You sh the idea is that these fields that you're building are really for printing and not for arithmetic. And we can, in fact, do some arithmetic with fields like this, but that's sort of an advanced topic. I'm not gonna get into that. If, as, as starting out in COBOL, if you're using these symbols in your edits, you should be thinking these fields as fields I need to print on a page. This is uh, this slide highlights the distinction between uh, fields that are used for arithmetic and fields that are designed for printing. 
Oh, if you define a field as S999 V99 packed decimal, uh, you're intending to do arithmetic. Anytime you use a V, there's an implied decimal point there. And it's the field is um, supposed to be used for arith arithmetic operations. Once you put a period in, though, that's a numeric edited field. You should use it to be for printing. Otherwise, it would be fine to do your arithmetic with X and then move it to Y where it could be printed. But you don't want to be trying to do arithmetic with numeric edited fields. And that's uh, a common beginning error. I'll stop there for a second just to see if, if there are any questions that we need to think about. So there was one question um, when you were talking about level numbers. Um, the question was, why does a level number from one jump to five, for instance, when you were, you know, talking at the next level? What about two to four? Is there any reason that's not used or is it used? There's some, it's somewhat arbitrary, but uh, uh, the idea is if you jump from one to five, if you have to go back and rework this uh, hierarchy, you can insert a lower level number between one and five right, on the fly. So uh, the level numbers are somewhat arbitrary, but there usually is some distance between them just to allow for future additions if, if necessary. All right, got it, thank you. All right, for some data types, if you're starting out in, on the mainframe, there's some data types you need to learn about. I'm not gonna get into all the details of these types, but just to ask you to, to look them up and take a look at their internal structures. Sorry, my mouse is trigger happy. So zone decimal, pack decimal, and binary. Most business arithmetic, 95% of all business arithmetic occurs at the pack decimal level. If you're in binary, you, you can, that's a fine format for counting if you want to count the number of customers you're processing if you want to measure how many bytes it is from one variable to another binary is fine zone decimal is a funny format we'll talk about it in a minute i will mention hexadecimal just for the beginners and only briefly we're going to use hexadecimal in in the future slides here just as a shorthand so again base 16 is hexadecimal. After you run out of digits, nine, we invent uh, more digits, A through F for 10 through 15. And the way we'll use it just briefly is this. If you have a binary collection of bits, we can let's say this is a byte, eight bits. We can divide it in half into two four-bit segments, and we can use one of these hexadecimal digits to represent each segment. So instead of looking at a bunch of ones and zeros all day, we can look at a bunch of hexadecimal digits all day. It's, it's a little easier to do that. Uh, so 1011 is one, two, no fours, and an eight. That's an uh, 11, which is a B. So essentially, you're just substituting hex digits in for binary patterns. And where do we do that? Well, we can do that in Epsidic. Epsidic is an encoding sequence for characters. We want to be able to store the letter A in memory. How can I do it? I can do it as a binary pattern, C1. Right? So there is a kind of a me method in this madness of Epsidic. The first block of letters, A through I, are in sequence as far as hexadecimal numbers, C1 through C9. And my tip here is, you should learn a few letters and digits in, in EBCDIC. Not asking to memorize an EBCDIC table, <clears throat> but it's helpful to be able to recognize uh, at least the letters and digits. So let's take a, a real quick look at the letters, C1 through C9. D1 through D9 is the middle block. A mnemonic is junior, J, R, right? So D1 through D9, there's only eight more letters, so we either have to leave off the first one or the last one, and IBM chose the first one, so that's E2 through E9. So there's, very quickly, the letters are easy to learn in EBCDIC, so are the digits F0 through F9. There's a handful of others that would be helpful to know, 
space is 40, period is a 4B, 6B for column, 5C, and 60 for a minus. So as a beginner, just take a quick look at EBCDIC and memorize a few of the symbols. It helps if you have to look at a storage dump. So here's my, here's my pop quiz. <laughs> here's, a, here's a field I've defined, balance, pick X7, value ABC. What does it look like in memory? It looks like that, right? It's a seven byte field. C1, C2, C3 for A, B, and C. There's a 40 for the blank and F1, F2, F3. So there's uh, what's in memory based on the EBCDIC coding sequence. This is the saddest slide I'm gonna present. I'm old enough to have punch cards. It's a sad fact, uh, but true. I was, I was a youngster, but uh, a youngster in college, unfortunately. And punching, I, what I didn't realize was by, by punching cards, where I was actually producing what's called zone decimal data. And the other thing I didn't know at that time was that COBOL will produce zone decimal data if you have a numeric field in which you omit the usage clause. In other words, you don't declare it. Here's, here's an example right here. You don't declare it to be binary. You don't declare it to be pack decimal or comp three or any of the other possibilities. If you don't specify, you get zone decimal by default. And let me describe my experience teaching our punching cards here. Let me get back to it. Whenever I punch cards, if you were going to punch a one, two, three, you would sit down in the machine, stick some cards in the machine. It would uh, feed over uh, the first card and you'd type a one and then you'd type a two. But when you got to the three, if this was a negative field, you would have to use two fingers. You'd have to find the negative a key and press it down and then press the three and the negative sign was encoded on the last digit and that technically is zone decimal data if you typed this field it's going to look like this in memory we'll see an f1 that was the one i typed the f2 was the two but it inserted a sign in the zone portion of the last byte and it's this format is a direct result of people punching cards so many years ago. It's usually not the best idea, not the best format to be in in COBOL, but you can accidentally get there if you forget the usage clause, as I did in this one up here. So technically, this is a display field, but you wouldn't be happy printing it. If you print this field, this will print as a 1, that'll print as a 2, and a D3 is an L in EBCDIC. So, <clears throat> Even though it's called a display field, it's not, uh, you won't be happy displaying it. So you can do arithmetic in this format. The COBOL compiler is very generous. If you get a zone decimal field, it will convert it for you without telling you. So um, that's one thing that COBOL does is it's very generous in the field definitions. It's willing to make numerous data changes in order to make the arithmetic work out for you. Here's just a few others. Uh, I'm just a negative one would end up being with three digits would end up being F0, F0, D1. There's the negative sign. If it was positive, you would end up with a positive sign in the last byte. If you forget the sign here, uh, that's usually not a good idea because COBOL will take make efforts to ensure that the sign ends up being positive. So my tips are. Don't forget to code your S's on these numeric fields. You usually want them there. And try to avoid zone decimal if possible. There is this idea of binary fields. You can do arithmetic in binary. Most business arithmetic doesn't occur in binary because when you convert from binary to decimal, there's all sorts of round off errors you get. So accountants get uh, antsy when you start losing pennies. So most business arithmetic occurs in pack decimal. And this machine is very sophisticated and it's capable of doing floating point arithmetic. Not only can it do floating point, it can do it in binary and hexadecimal and even decimal floating point. So it turns out that if you work in pack decimal, 
the compiler may decide to optimize your code and actually use some floating point decimal in the background. And that may be something that an older time COBOL programmer might not be aware of, but it can happen. So there's uh, a little bit about binary. Here's my beginner's tip. If the calculation involves implied decimal points, we need to be in pack decimal because you're going to get Randolph errors moving from binary to decimal. The weights are completely different, right? The weights in, in decimal are all powers of 10, and the weights in binary are all powers of 2, and they're, they're just some things you can make in one base that you can't make in the other if, if, if you have a fixed number of weights. So my, my beginner's tip is to use pack decimal. I, I'm about out of time. Should we go on or should I clip through this? Uh, last no, go go on, Dr. Wilbright. This is great. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, there's not much more. We're, we're almost at the end. This is probably the most important data type you uh, you would use as a COBOL business programmer. It's packed decimal. It's also called computational three. That's an older name for it. Or comp three is also the name for it. Basically, I'm not going into all the details, but you get two digits per byte and a sign stored in this format. So a negative 23 would actually look like this, 0, 2, 3, and a sign at the end. There's always an, an odd number of digits, no matter what kind of picture you put out here. Internally, there will always be an odd number of digits because we always have a sign at the end. So that's a little bit about packed decimal. Most packed decimal, most business arithmetic occurs in packed decimal. Uh, just quickly, there's a rule about figuring out the size of these. If you're if you're defining what your input looks like, you have to know exactly how many bytes are in it. So a field like this has five digits in front of the implied decimal, two digits behind. That's seven digits in all plus the sign. That makes eight things. And so we know we know we're packing two things to a byte. That would be a four byte field. So I'll, I'll quickly move on to the, to this. These are the old type names you would see in some older COBOL programs and even modern programs. Computational comp. Those are names for binary data. Comp one and comp two. You rarely see those in older COBOL programs. Those were floating point. That was usually binary floating point. So it was for two reasons why you might not want to be in that. Comp3 is a, a very common type that you will see, but it's equivalent to pack decimal. And I've gotten it into the habit of using this name instead. So these are the names I use these days. These are sort of older definitions for the same thing. If you're just starting out, think binary or pack decimal. Those, that's, my, that's my recommendation for that. There's some relationships in these three data types. Remember when I was typing, uh, punching cards? It's about as low as you can get on the totem pole is if you punch cards. And the, the data ends up kind of at the lowest level in this hierarchy. If you're in zone decimal, you can switch to pack. There are conversions of the data that will carry you into pack and back. If you're in pack, you can move into binary from there and back. But this pack decimal is sort of in the middle of things. It's in, and particularly in the middle of all business arithmetic. Working here is mostly where we want to be. I will only just briefly mention this. If you're working in a company, you may run into a company that has what's called PAC no sign data. That is a non native data type. And the idea was we would take a date and store it in a packed format. Well, if you take this date as just a big number and store it here, you end up with a zero at the front and a sign at the end. You end up with a zero always at the front because there's always an even number of digits in a date, and every pack number has an odd number of digits. So someone had the bright idea, okay, well, we can pack the date and then get rid of the zero and get rid of the sign and end up looking like this. And you can do that in COBOL but it takes some special handling to do that. And that means every time you want to reference a date, you have to do some arithmetic. So maybe this was a bad idea in hindsight. It does have the 
uh, effect of reducing dates by one byte. Uh, there's something to be said for that. But if your company has this kind of data, you have to deal with it and you have to do it, deal with it programmatically. If there's time, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, just do a couple more things and let, let it go. You cannot do this, this sort of thing in many languages. I'll redefine. Here I've defined a field, pick X, Z, Z, nine, nine, with a decimal point and negative sign. That's one, two, three, four, five, six bytes. I come back right underneath, I say amount X redefines amount. I'm gonna give it a completely different picture. So what we've done is taken a variable and given it two different, completely different pictures. You could not get away with that in Java, which is a, a more strongly typed language and would get upset if you tried to give the same storage area two sort of different pictures like that. But you can do that in COBOL. It's always a neat thing and it has lots of uses. And uh, in particular, I use it this way. Uh, there's this idea of pointers now in COBOL. That's fairly new on the COBOL scene. A pointer is an address. It's a four byte address, but the COBOL compiler does not want you to print it. In other words, you can't display these things directly. COBOL doesn't like that. So what I'll do is I'll take a pointer and redefine it as a binary full word, and then I can print it, and then I can see the address. So there is a use for redefines, and you can use it in some fairly interesting ways. There are no constants in COBOL. That's all I'm going to say about this. You can define a value for a field, but there's no way to make it constant. Everything can change. There are a few figurative constants, zero, space, high values, low values, quote. You can set a pointer to null. All is an interesting word. It's, technically, it's not a figurative concept, but you can use it in an interesting way. You can say, I want a 50 byte field with all three. So instead of having to type out 50 threes, I can just use the word all. Let me just show you briefly a table. We'll let this almost be the last slide. Here's a, a quick table, a uh, 15 byte field with these letters in it. I come back and do a redefines on top of it with an occurs. So my redefines is for a picture three field that occurs five times. So I'm chopping this thing up into five parts, and that gives me the ability to treat this as a table. COBOL programmers call them tables. Everybody else in the world calls them arrays. You can use arrays in, in uh, COBOL. Uh, the one, one big difference in COBOL tables or arrays is that everything starts off at one, just like your kindergarten teacher told you to count, start at one and go forward, and that's what COBOL does. So moving month three here would grab March. Um, so COBOL tables are one base. Subscripts can be any integer type. This is a good choice for subscripts. There is also this thing called indexes. I'm not gonna get into that. If you really wanna maximize the efficiency of your array, uh, arrays or tables. Here's a Sudoku array. The, uh, the last thing I'm gonna say about Tables is, one thing I love about COBOL is it gives you so many ways to go after the data. If I use the word Sudoku table here, I get the whole table. If I use the word Sudoku row, I can access an entire row. If I use the word cell, I can get at an individual cell. So it gives you lots of names for processing tables. And that's about it. I think that's the end of the talk. Wow, that was, that was a lot of detail here, Dr. Wilbright. Thank you so much. It wasn't too much. <laughs> if, it, if it was, you can go back and look at the slides. You can go back to my uh, it, it, blog you did site a for job just talking about all of these and, you know, explaining it in so much great detail and differentiating why and those beginner tips were just awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilbright. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I, um, I do have one question. Hang on. I was just looking at it. Oh, yes. Can Dr. Wilbright explain why zoned decimal is a bad choice? The default? Uh, let's, say, uh, let's say you define a field as zoned decimal and you give it a value. And then you start doing arithmetic. It will work. The COBOL compiler will accept it and take it. 
But underneath, it's having to do those conversions. Remember where if you, if you, oops, here, if you're, if you start out in zoned and you want to do arithmetic, the COBOL compiler is going to have to convert that data into packed. Um, you cannot print this data. So I, I guess just from, a, you know, I'm an old assembler programmer. I try to be in the right data type when, if I can. So zone decimal is not really a good arithmetic type. The comp you can't do arithmetic at this level. In order to accomplish arithmetic, it's got to be converted to pack. That, that would be my, my reasoning. Sometimes the, you may not have a choice. Maybe the data comes to you in a zone format. But that's a kind of a rare thing. Most, most business arithmetic is in this format. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question is, can you explain numeric edited fields with an example? Uh, sure. Let me back up. Yeah, okay, thank you. And, yeah, I forget where they were, uh, there. Uh, yeah. so for instance, suppose you want to, this one here is a alphanumeric edited field, right? It, these are four letters or digits. So maybe you move a social security into here. If you do, these two spaces will end up being blank. Or if you move a numeric date, if you move a numeric date into this field, you'll end up with slashes in it. Or this particular field, you will end up zero suppressing the leading zeros. They won't be printed, neither will the comma. If let's say the amount was $1.29 negative, you would end up with, um, Blank, 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 1.29 debit, right? If the field was positive, um, the debit would disappear. So the, the edit symbols are for using, uh, for doing certain, making the data look good when it gets printed. Here's a floating minus sign, or this is a check protect symbol to make sure nobody can come back and change the amount on the check, or a floating dollar sign. There's, there's, there's a lot. I have left out here. There's a lot to this. This is one place where you really need to put your nose in the manual and just look at a lot of different programs to see how people are editing. It's not really for a short talk. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Don't have any books. I have a, a blog site and there is a video course, a COBOL video course on there, uh, complete with uh, exercises you can try. Uh, it was designed, I did it a number of years ago for a company. So it's organized around five days of work, eight hours a day. There's a lot of material there and you can find it on that blog site. Um, this this word here, good code, we've defined it as an 88. That makes it a condition. And the condition it defines is, uh, is, is, is this one, that the trend code has a value in it of G. If that condition exists, it is equivalent to this, the COBOL compiler equates that to this um, word, good code. So uh, there's nothing like this in any other language. That's why I think uh, people stumble over it at first when you, because it's, it's not really like anything else in another language, the ability to assign a name to a condition, right? We're, we think names belong to variables, you know, values, but here we're, we're giving an, a name to a condition and the condition is trancode has a value of G, trancode equals G, there it is right there.
grand code equals G is equivalent to this word, good code. And I can use that in an if statement, or I can do a set statement on it to make this condition become true. It's a powerful feature, and when you use it in conjunction with other aspects of the language, you can make the language really readable. All right, um, I'm just gonna look for maybe one last question, Dr. Wilbright, and then. Hey, I've got one opinion I'd like to give before this is all over. Yes, please. <laughs> Is this a good time? Yes, absolutely. Please do share. Let me go down here. I've got one more slide somewhere. Oops, went the wrong way. Sorry. I'll get there in a minute. There. <laughs> this is uh, this is uh, these are some of the things that have happened in my lifetime to COBOL. This is not uh, Grace Hopper's COBOL. It's not even your mother's COBOL, right? This is a very powerful language. And all of these features are transformative in how we write COBOL today. Just these two features, the fact that we have inline performs and delimiters completely re uh, revises the way COBOL programs should look. The loosening of the rules in the linkage section, the fact that we have pointers and we can allocate memory uh, on the fly. There's lots of new statements for flow of control and logic. Uh, you should look at evaluate. That is the most interesting statement in, in, in almost any language going, especially any any switch statement. This is kind of an amazing uh, statement called evaluate that's for logical, making logical decisions. We can do XML. There's this idea of nested support and nested programs, very interesting. And we can also do object orientation. What we need are younger people with different ideas and who are willing to reimagine how COBOL programs uh, should be written. That's my, that's my opinion. <laughs> Storing numbers, if you, uh, if you want to. Oh, zone decimal. Uh, the reason you have zone decimal is just to store numeric numbers. And it's it's really a throwback to punch cards. It was a data type that existed to accommodate punch card input. And we still have it today. Um, that's why I think we should try and avoid it if possible. It's not a very efficient type uh, to use. It's You can't do arithmetic in it. So about all it's good for is storing numbers in. And it doesn't really do a very good job of that because it stores one digit per byte. At least if we get it into PACT, we'll have two digits per byte. So it's not a format you want to use much of. Sure. All right. Um, we're at just about at the top of the hour. Thank you again so, so much, Dr. Wilbright. I mean, the comments have been. Uh, on the chat line have also been very um, thankful. Uh, you know, the details that you walked them through, they found it very helpful. Um, so I think this was, this has just been great to be able to really walk us through um, in detail and also be able to explain the differences. That was very, very um, nicely done. Really appreciate you sharing all this immense knowledge with us here this morning, Dr. Wilbright. Thank you Thank so you. much. I just love what y'all are doing uh, with this project. It's, I've had so much fun watching and participating. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I, we're um, looking forward to having um, access to this deck. I think you said you would be able to put that out on your blog and we'll link out to it along with the replay. All right, um, I'll do that. <laughs>